watching the Catholic Family Podcast, Sundays with Father Dennis. Straight talk and real Catholicism from Father Dennis Chacoin, a true pioneer of the traditional Catholic movement. We would like to spend this time, the rest of the time that we have, again trying to encourage those of you that are familiar with the book True Devotion that was written by St. Louis Mita Montford to re-examine and see whether or not you are in fact making an effort to live that consecration that he explains in the book True Devotion. For those of you who are not familiar with it, we would like to take this time to explain it to you. When our Blessed Mother appeared at Fatima, among other things, she quite often made reference to her Immaculate Heart, or she used that terminology, reparation to my Immaculate Heart, or she complained about something and said the solution would be in consecrating oneself to her Immaculate Heart. And I'm going to refresh your memory here. Our Lady said to the children, Are you willing to offer yourselves to God and to bear all the sufferings He wills to send you in reparation for the sins by which He is offended and as intercession for the conversion of sinners? Lucia, speaking for the three, says yes. Whereupon the lady adds, you will have much to suffer, but the grace of God will always be your comfort and your assistance. Again, Our Lady reminding us here that if we choose to follow God and do the holy will of God, we indeed will have here on earth much to suffer. But at the same time, we will also have the graces necessary to make it possible for us to eventually save our souls. Lucia said to Our Lady, I would like to ask you to take us to heaven. The Lady answered, Yes, I will take Jacinta and Francisco soon, but you must remain here some time longer. Jesus wishes to use you to make me known and loved. He wishes to establish throughout the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. Must I then stay here alone? That seemed an intolerable suffering. No, my child, answered the lady, but would that make you suffer much? I will never abandon you. My immaculate heart will be your refuge and the path leading you to God. When saying these words, the lady opened her hands and communicated for the second time the wondrous light which enveloped her. In it we saw ourselves as it were immersed in God. Jacinta and Francisco seemed to be in the ark near heaven where they were soon to go, I in the part near earth where I was still to stay. In front of the lady's right hand appeared a heart surrounded by thorns which pierced it. This we understood to be the Immaculate Heart of Mary, outraged by the sins of men and asking reparation. And another apparition, sacrifice yourself for sinners, she advised, and say often, especially when you make some sacrifice, O oh Jesus, this is for love of thee, for the conversion of sinners, and in reparation for sins committed against the Immaculate Heart of Mary. After Our Lady showed the children a vision of hell, she says, You have seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wishes to establish in the world devotion to my Immaculate Heart. If what I say to you is done, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace. Then when she talked about the outbreak of war, she said, To prevent this, I ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart, and the communion of reparation on the first Saturdays. And finally she said, in the end, my Immaculate Heart will triumph. So again, I repeat, a number of times when Our Lady appeared at Fatima, she made reference to her Immaculate Heart and devotion to her Immaculate Heart. Now, we know as Catholics, we were taught as Catholics very simply that while our Divine Lord is the Redeemer and the Messiah, at the same time, in God's plan, he gave to our Blessed Mother a specific role to fulfill. We know that Almighty God did not have to make use of Our Lady, that he could have sent his divine son into the world as a full-grown man. It was not necessary for him to have an earthly mother. But again, God chose to send his divine son into the world through Mary, and he gave her a specific role to fulfill. St. Louis Marie de Montfort explains to us in a beautiful treatise, a book, called True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin, what it means to consecrate oneself to Our Lady. Uh, quite often, non-Catholics misunderstand what it means when we say devotion to Mary. Quite often, 
non-Catholics get upset when they hear Catholics make so much reference to our Blessed Mother. And some poor people actually think that we adore our Blessed Mother. They even have a term for it called Mariolatry, a form of idolatry. Now, obviously, as Catholics, the only one that we adore is Almighty God. But at the same time, I repeat, it is God's plan that we honor his mother, Christ himself, when he said, learn of me, for I am meek and humble of heart. In other words, learn from my example. We know that he lived for 33 years, and 30 of those years he spent living with our blessed mother before he began, began to preach and teach publicly. And quite often it happens as you read church history when the enemies of God seem to be getting the upper hand at the same time, Almighty God either raises a saint or makes us aware of his will by having some sacramental introduced in order to combat this particular problem. And certainly, St. Louis Mita Montford was a special saint who was raised up for our times because he came forth with a solution to the onslaught that is being experienced now by those who live in these latter times. And the treatise that he wrote called True Devotion, I repeat, True Devotion to the Blessed Virgin, is the solution. Now, if you were to read the book True Devotion and compare what is contained there with what Our Lady said at Fatima, it's one and the same thing. Nothing different. Again, everything that is contained in True Devotion, basically, is mentioned by Our Blessed Mother when she appeared at Fatima. We know that it was not the purpose of Our Lady at Fatima to introduce a new religion. Again, she simply repeated what we as Catholics were taught. It is the role of Our Lady to lead us along the path of her divine Son. And St. Louis Mita Montford in his book, True Devotion, says the purpose of devotion to Mary is to lead us to Christ, to make us more Christ-like. Now, if by having devotion to Mary we were led away from Christ, then it would be wrong for us to have devotion to Mary. But you know as well as I do that just the opposite takes place. As a matter of fact, we've had many opportunities in the course of going around and giving lectures to meet over the years thousands of people and to have spoken to quite a few people and to find out that the greater majority of them who seem to understand when we're describing about what's been taking place either pray the rosary or used to pray the rosary or have some devotion to Our Lady. And it seems that in the degree that someone has this devotion to Our Lady, they're capable of understanding the truth and recognizing the truth when they hear it. On the other hand, you have hundreds of millions of people who on one hand talk about Jesus, and on the other hand have very little use for Mary, his mother, and cannot understand the truth. There are so many different TV programs today where they have these Protestant ministers, and now it's being done with clergy in the Vatican II Church. They're becoming evangelists. And they go on and on and on about our divine Lord. And obviously, as Catholics, we should talk about our divine Lord. But again, they make little or nothing about Our Lady. As a matter of fact, some of them, in a veiled way, ridicule the concept of having devotion to the saints or a blessed mother. And again, that's why these poor people are blind spiritually. So instead of going into detail in and explaining the whole book, True Devotion, we would like to convince you that it would be worth your while to get the book and to read it if you haven't done so already. And again, if you have read this book, if you already have consecrated yourself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, according to the method taught by St. Louis Mita Montford, but you've slipped, you haven't been living accordingly, again, we would encourage you to reread it and to actually make it a way of life. Read a little bit of it every day. If you can't read it every day, at least from time to time, read it. Familiarize yourself with it so as to make it a way of life. St. Louis Mita Monfort died in the year 1716, and this book, or the manuscript as it is called, was found in the year 1842, 126 years after his death. 
In 1853, the decree was pronounced at Rome declaring that his writing was exempt from all error which could be a bar to his canonization. And eventually he was canonized a saint. Now, St. Louis Mita Montford made a prophecy that the devil would try to prevent this treatise from being promoted, and he actually predicted that the works would be smothered in the silence of a coffer. It would be hidden in a trunk. It was found in the year 1842 by accident by one of the priests of his congregation, and then it was sent to Rome. We would like to, for some of you, refresh your memories in regard to the mind of the church and her popes, and this is what we're supposed to do, isn't it, as Catholics? See what the church says and see what the popes have to say. And in this case, regarding the devotion that was taught by St. Louis Marie de Montfort, here's what it says in the introduction to the book. Pope Leo XIII blessed the confraternity of Mary, Queen of Hearts, established by the late Archbishop Duhamel at Ottawa, Canada. On his deathbed, he prayed to Blessed de Montfort, whom he had beatified, and consecrated himself to Our Lady as a slave of love. So again, that's Pope Leo XIII. Read the book, True Devotion, was familiar with it, obviously, and on his deathbed, consecrated himself as a slave of Our Lady. Before composing the encyclical letter for the Jubilee of the Immaculate Conception, Pope St. Pius X, who was well acquainted with Blessed de Montfort's True Devotion, read it over again. He mastered so well the doctrine contained therein that the thoughts and even the words of the holy missionary are to be found in his admirable encyclical itself. The holy pontiff made no secret of this. He asserted it to, among others, Father Lumo, superior general of the Company of Mary at that time. It was also Pius X who granted the apostolic benediction to all those who would read True Devotion, and the same pope raised the confraternity of Mary, Queen of Hearts, to the dignity of an arch-confraternity. Finally, on the occasion of his golden jubilee in the priesthood, he wished to be inscribed as a member of the Association of the Priests of Mary. So again, here's two popes, Pope Leo XIII, Pope St. Pius X. So if someone comes up to you and says, yeah, you're a f fanatic. You're reading that stuff written by de Montfort? Isn't that a weird type of devotion? I mean, a slave of Mary or a slave of Jesus? You know, strange terms. All you have to say is, well, if it's strange to you, isn't it something that Pope Leo XIII was a slave of Mary? Isn't it something that Pope St. Pius X knew the book, read the book, and used the words of St. Louis Mita Montfort himself in his encyclical letter? I'd rather be associated with strange Pope Leo XIII and strange Pope St. Pius X than those others who call us strange for having this type of devotion. We know that it is not a church law that you have to be a slave of Jesus through Mary. It's not a church law. But at the same time, are we not supposed to look to the popes, listen to what they say, and imitate them? Going on, Pope Benedict XV, writing to the Superior General of the Fathers of the Company of Mary and of the Daughters of Wisdom, and again, these are the, St. Louis Mita Mantra was the founder of the Company of Mary and of the Daughters of Wisdom. In 1916, on the occasion of the 200th anniversary of Blessed de Montfort's death, this is what Pope Benedict XV said, Your blessed founder wishes it to be your characteristic and special aim to promote among the kingdom of God by the diffusion of the devotion to his Holy Mother. Now, as a very efficacious means of this apostolate, he has left you that you may explain it to the faithful the book of the true devotion to the Blessed Virgin. Small in size indeed, but of such high authority and unction, we rejoice that it has already been so widely spread by your efforts. And may it spread still more and revive the Christian spirit in an ever-increasing number of souls. So we have a third pope, Pope Benedict XV. When on Christmas 1924, the late Cardinal Mercier presented His Holiness Pope Pius XI with a copy of True Devotion, he asked the Holy Father whether he were acquainted with it or not. The Pope replied, Not only am I acquainted with it, but I have practiced it since my youth. On another occasion, the same Pope affirmed to Cardinal Chereau, the late Archbishop of Rennes, France, that he knew his contents almost by heart. So again, his popes, four popes, Leo XIII, St. Pius X, Benedict XV, and Pope Pius XI. So again, as Catholics, if we're told we should look to 
the Holy Fathers for direction. We have four of our modern Holy Fathers, recent Holy Fathers, who, has given us, who have given us the example regarding true devotion. Cardinal O'Connell, who writes a preface in the book, says as follows. The more we reflect, the more we realize that the mission of Christianity is to take possession of man in his entirety in order to transform him into a soul worthy of heaven. Hence, Pope Pius XI, in speaking of Christian education, says that its proper and immediate end is to cooperate with divine grace in forming the true and perfect Christian, that is to form Christ himself in those regenerated by baptism. In this work of transformation, a definite part has been assigned by God to the Blessed Virgin Mary, that of leading souls to Jesus Christ and of keeping them in his love. Hence, the role of Mary, Mother of God and Mediatrix of all grace, ought not to be overlooked. Indeed, the recognition of the high dignity granted her by God leads her clients toward a richer understanding of the mysteries of Christ and a fuller participation in the fruits of the redemption. Our Holy Mother the Church has recognized the merit of the treatise on the true devotion to Mary in conferring upon its author the honor of beatification. She has approved and enriched with numerous indulgences the arch confraternity of Mary, Queen of Hearts. It is our conviction that a wider diffusion of this work, of great unction and authority, to use the words of His Holiness Benedict XV, will draw souls from every walk of life to a greater interior perfection and a fuller development of Christian piety. So again, another encouragement, this time from a cardinal, insofar as being acquainted with and making an effort to practice that which is explained by St. Louis Rita Munford. Father Faber, who translated True Devotion from French into English, also has a preface in the book, and we would like to read a part of that preface to you. All those who are likely to read this book love God and lament that they do not love him more. All desire something for his glory, the spread of some good work, the success of some devotion, the coming of some good time. One man has been striving for years to overcome a particular fault and has not succeeded. Another mourns and almost wonders while he mourns that so few of his relations and friends have been converted to the faith. One grieves that he has not enough devotion. Another that he has a cross to carry which is a peculiarly impossible cross to him while a third has domestic troubles and family unhappiness which feel almost incompatible with his salvation. And for all these things, prayer appears to bring so little remedy. What is the remedy that is wanted? What is the remedy indicated by God himself? If we may rely on the disclosures of the saints, it is an immense increase of devotion to our Blessed Lady. But remember, nothing short of an immense one. Our Father Faber was from England. Here in England, Mary is not half enough preached. Devotion to her is low and thin and poor. It is frightened out of its wits by the snares of heresy. It is always invoking human respect and carnal prudence, wishing to make Mary so little of a Mary that Protestants may feel at ease about her. Its ignorance of theology makes it unsubstantial and unworthy. It is not the prominent characteristic of our religion, which it ought to be. It has no faith in itself. Hence it is that Jesus is not loved, that heretics are not converted, and that the church is not exalted, that souls which might be saints wither and dwindle, that the sacraments are not rightly frequented, or souls enthusiastically evangelized. Jesus is obscured because Mary is kept in the background. Thousands of souls perish because Mary is withheld from them. It is the miserable, unworthy shadow which we call our devotion to the Blessed Virgin that is the cause of all these wants and blights, these evils and omissions and declines. Yet if we are to believe the revelations of the saints, God is pressing for a greater, wider, stronger, and quite another devotion to his Blessed Mother. I cannot think of a higher work or a broader vocation for anyone than the simple spreading of this peculiar devotion of the Venerable Grignon de Montfort, St. Louis Mere de Montfort. Let a man but try it for himself, and his surprise at the graces it brings with it, and the transformations it causes in his soul, will soon convince him of its otherwise almost incredible efficacy as a means for the salvation of men and for the coming of the kingdom of Christ. Oh, if Mary were but known, there would be no coldness to Jesus then. Oh, if Mary were but known, how much more wonderful would be our faith and how different would our communions be.
Oh, if Mary were but known, how much happier and how much holier, how much less worldly should we be, and how much more should we be living images of our sole Lord and Savior, her dearest and most blessed Son. So quite obviously by his words, he makes it very clear that the reason for having devotion to Mary is so that through her, we will be more Christ-like. Now we're going to comment on the preliminary remarks that St. Louis Maria de Montfort makes at the beginning of the book, and again just encourage you to either reread the book, or if you don't have a book, to purchase a copy and to read it.